Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to get started. So firstly, I just want to thank you all for uh, taking the time to attend today's webinar on SimLab, uh, the all-in-one multi-physics simulation tool. Uh, my name is Drew Buchanan. I am a senior applications engineer here at True Insight. Um, so if you've ever uh, talk to me in a support ticket, or you know, if you've ever sort of engaged me on the pre-sales side, we, we may have chatted before. Um, but if we haven't, I'm really happy to be meeting you all. Um, I'm based here on the East Coast, um, out of Philadelphia. It's actually a, a pretty nice day, so uh, really excited to be here to be leading this webinar. Um, I'm going to be kicking off just a couple polls right now, just as we kind of start this presentation. So feel free to kind of work through the, these. Um, uh, these poll questions, and uh, uh, we can kind of go from there. Okay, great. So let's jump into this. So firstly, if you're unfamiliar with Altair um, and who we are um, at True Insight, True Insight is a channel partner um, for Altair. Um, Altair really is, you know, uh, allows uh, designers, engineers, to kind of you know utilize their decision making through leveraging simulation, HBC, and AAI. Um, you know, today we're talking about multi-physics and the benefit of multi-physics, but it's important to keep in mind that we have a lot of physics simulations um, available, um, and not even specifically physics. It can be uh, data analytics or IoT um, or HBC. So um, ultimately, if you have some type of question, whether it's related to SimLab um, or if it's related to um, anything else, reach out. We probably have a solution for you. Okay, great. I'm gonna change one of these. I have a few more questions here. So thank you for answering some of those questions. Um, so the other thing I'll point out, if you're unfamiliar with what, who Altair is, maybe this is your first exposure to Altair. We've been around since the 80s, um, you know, started out in the kind of the pre-processor world with HyperMesh, um, sort of jumping into solvers as well. Um, and since that time, we've grown to you know, include solvers, pre and post, as well as a, a bunch of other simulation uh, tools that pertain to pretty much every single industry. Um, you know, automotive, uh, industrial goods. We've been seeing a lot of people looking at financial services, which would be, you know, not, not directly the types of simulations we're talking about today, but ultimately, again, you know, just pointing out if you have some type of challenge, uh, let us know, and we'd definitely be able to, to kind of chat and talk about that. And I think I have one more question. I just want to ask you guys. Thank you again for answering the poll questions. Um, just another kind of logistic things. Feel free to answer, ask questions. My colleague Tyler is going to be uh, answering questions in the chat as I'm going through this webinar. Uh, we'll also sort of save some questions for the end. So if he can't answer those questions, I'll be sort of fielding those questions for the end of the presentation as well. So um, yeah, feel free to send those questions in the chat. So what's our agenda for today? Um, first, we'll kind of be get, giving a background of what Altair SimLab is, um, looking at some of the questions. Some of you guys are familiar with SimLab, some of you um, are not. Um, so kind of a good sort of background of where everyone is with multi-physics environment. And then we'll kind of take a look at, you know, some real life demonstrations um, on the meshing side of, of things, as well as on the solver, and then also on automation. And we'll close it out with some questions. So yeah, definitely some really interesting um, results in this poll. Um, definitely some people who've used multi-physics tools, but maybe not SimLab. Um, looks like Workbench and maybe some of the CAD-based uh, multi-physics tools, and some people have not. So great. Okay. So what exactly is SimLab? And maybe a, a good sort of overview of what exactly is a multi-physics tool. So um, a multi-physics tool really allows you to solve uh, multiple types of problems and model multiple types of applications. So SimLab is a multi-physics environment. What that means is you can potentially mesh app uh, solutions. Um, so you can mesh both 2D and 3D models. Um, and you can make that mesh preparation for, you know, um, util utilizing it for a solving case or maybe you're exporting. Um, uh, in a multi-physics environment, you're probably going to have multiple 
uh, types of tools you're going to solve. So in the case of SimLab, we actually have multiple solvers we can, you know, solve. Uh, running the gamut from traditional structural uh, finite element simulation like linear statics to explicit dynamics, all the way through electromagnetics to um, potentially manufacturing solutions like injection molding um, and uh, you know welding analysis. Um, the beauty of working in a multi-physics environment, as you guys will see as we work through this, is you can set up a system, so like a real uh, an application I'm going to show you is a, a thermal FSI application, where say you're running a CFD application um, where you want to look at the temperature gradient. And we know through physics that um, that increased the thermal gradient is going to cause some thermal stress. So we can actually couple that solution, meaning we set everything up in SimLab and we run both the CFD and also, also the structural application. So um, uh, kind of the other thing that's really nice about SimLab is we also have automation capabilities. So we can actually automate tasks and you can really run the gamut in terms of what you're trying to automate, you know, running, um, writing Python scripts um, to, for really sort of simulating entire applications of your, your finite element case. And um, also, you know, you know, for meshing, for solving, et cetera, there's a lot of capabilities there. Lastly, one of the most powerful things about SimLab um, and why you might want to work in a multi-physics environment is because it's easy to use. A lot of you guys probably are doing, um, you're solving a lot of problems. Maybe you're not looking at simulation every single day and you need to have a tool that's easy to jump into that, you know, when you jump into simulation, you can, you know, hop that right back in and make sure you understand it. And then you might have other tasks in your job, you know, you know, working as a design engineer, uh, design reviews, you're not in simulation every day, like some, some of our other high-end tools, which are more based around if you're actually working as a stress analyst. So the first thing we'll talk about is meshing. Um, so uh, uh, SimLab offers multiple meshing techniques. I actually ran a webinar a few months ago on HyperMesh. Um, if you haven't checked that out, um, it's on our, our YouTube. And HyperMesh is a very powerful meshing algorithm. One of the things that Altair does very, very well in both 2D for, and 3D is meshing. And the same thing can be said about SimLab. SimLab has multiple meshing techniques that really allow users to edit meshes and create meshes. Um, one of the common things that I'll run into of customers that may have utilized FEA, maybe in a CAD context, is they're limited by the type of elements. So for instance, um, both Fusion and SOLIDWORKS use TET meshing. Um, TET meshing it often requires you to have a lot more TETs for accuracy. Within the case of SimLab, you can take advantage of hex meshing. Um, so that's something that's very powerful. Um, we also have these advanced kind of meshing tools like logo removal, uh, fillet removal, things that are typically you can't do in kind of lower tiered uh, uh, FEA or CFD environments. The other really neat thing about SimLab, um, and this is again a common workflow, is we might have customers who are, they have to use um, other solvers, you know, like they might have to use LS Dyna, they might have to use Abacus, or they might have an internal sort of um, solver they have to utilize. You can prepare a solver deck within SimLab and then export it out. And I'll show that when we jump into the actual demonstration. And lastly, uh, mesh templates can be utilized to automate meshing. So let's jump into our actual um, our tool right now and kind of go through some, uh, some meshing applications here. So the first thing I'll point out is this is kind of the multi-physics application. I'll talk a little bit more about this as we jump into the solvers uh, section of this, of this webinar. But you see, I have the ability to run multiple different types of solutions all within the same tool. You know, traditionally, like old, old non-multi-physics tools, you'd have to open up a CFD-based program or a structural program. You can do everything within SimLab within the same interface. All right, so let's go through some, some meshing here. I have a couple meshing examples I can show you. Um, the first thing I'll point out is the import options. So this is a CAD file. Um, it was a SOLIDWORKS part file. Uh, but I also had a, as a parasolid, you can in, you know, pretty much import all of the big CAD tools out there um, or generic formats like parasolid directly into the environment. The other thing that I mentioned is we can also import solver decks. 
why is this you know powerful? Why is this is useful? Well, um, you may be uh, somebody who works with other um, uh, branches within your company that they use other solvers. So for instance, I could bring in an LS Dyna deck. Um, I could bring in a Nastran deck. So even if you don't aren't using those tools, you can bring in the actual solver and know the setup. The same can be said is, you know, if you have to solve using different solvers, I can export a solver deck. So uh, when I go here to uh, specifications or models, I can export it out accordingly. All right, so let's go through the process of, of meshing this. Um, so when we actually bring up our meshing pane right here, you see we have a bunch of different controls. I'm just gonna step you through kind of some of the meshing processes. So in this case, um, we wanna actually mesh both components within our model browser here. We have our internal component. This is just our logo and kind of our external component. So just uh, kind of a, a pretty basic design for you guys to get familiar with the workflow to begin with. And one of the really powerful things about the mesh controls within SimLab is um, I have the ability to apply advanced mesh controls and I can save these out as templates as well. So, you know, uh, tr traditionally a mesh control really allows you to locally refine a specific part of your model. And why is this useful? Um, with FEA or CFD or any type of solution that you're simulating, there's a balance of having an accurate mesh uh, without having an excessive mesh. You know, the more elements you have in any, any solver is gonna be, going to require you to solve a lot longer. So let's sort of apply a, a mesh right here. Um, and before we do that, uh, let's just measure. I'm going to change my units here. So I'm going to change it to IPS. OK, look at my units right there. So that tells me what I sort of want on the unit side of things. So what I'm actually going to apply is I'm going to put a body mesh control on this component of um, 0.125 inches and hit OK. So when I actually go to my mesh control icon, you see it's saved within my tree. So um, that's creating, when I actually apply my global mesh, it's going to sort of generate a mesh control of 0.125 inches. OK. So the other thing that I can say about mesh controls is we have the ability to sort of automatically defeature logos and details. Um, adjust uh, mesh controls, meaning the, the mesh density along fillets or cylinders, um, as well as some more advanced capabilities like uh, you know, imprinting a circle or uh, adjusting your layers in the mesh. So let's generate a mesh here. So um, this is my global mesh and I'm generating what's known as a surface mesh. So the surface mesh, and one of the things that's powerful about SimLab versus you know, CAD-based FEA is we're creating a mesh representation, meaning that um, we actually create a FEM representation, um, meaning that uh, it's not doing it directly on the geometry, it's, it's referencing the geometry and creating the mesh. Why this is powerful is if you bring in a geometry, um, you could potentially remove features on the mesh uh, specifically. Um, so let's uh, specify a global mesh size of 0.25 and Remember, I specified a mesh control of 0.125 for the center. So watch what happens to that center mesh. As it's actually meshing, and I'm doing this all in real time, you see how it creates a more fine mesh on the, on the, on the actual interior. Um, it's just, again, a way of being able to adjust our mesh. Some of the other kind of really neat features about our mesh controls built within SimLab, um, here, this icon right here on the remesh. So I could click on this top surface and say, I wanna go down to 0.125, um, hit okay. It's gonna regenerate the mesh on just that top surface. And you see how it automatically updates and changes that mesh. Um, bear in mind again, that it's creating a surface mesh. So meaning it's creating the mesh on the outer surfaces. Um, we'll talk about 3D meshing in a moment, um, but it's just generating the outer sort of surface mesh. Um, one of the other great things about our tool is we have a way of checking our mesh directly. So um, a great tool is using this quality check. And remember, meshing is pretty much, you know, even if we're in, within SimLab, everything is governed based off the numerical method of, of meshing. Um, 
So what we can actually do is we can actually look at our entire model, hit compute, and it will tell us where we have some specific problem areas. So an aspect ratio, um, it's a really useful sort of uh, way of analyzing how your mesh is. An aspect ratio is an element's largest side by its smallest side. You know, a value of one would mean all sides are equivalent. Um, so generally when you're looking at just quality checks, you try to shoot for aspect ratios less than five. That's not always the case in every single FEA or CFD uh, scenario, but that's just a kind of a, a way you can sort of ascertain if you have a good baseline mesh. And some of these other values like Jacobian and skew, these are other pertinent values you'd wanna look at. But we note in this case for, in general, most of the models are pretty good mesh, but there is like maybe less than a percent error. We can actually hit display and it's gonna show us where you know, we have high aspect ratios, which is, again, just a real powerful way of looking at our tool from a meshing perspective. Some of the other things that we can do, which are very, very neat in terms of meshing, um, is we can regenerate a mesh via a grid. You know, if you actually had a sort of a Cartesian grid right here, I could change these tri uh, elements to be quads and hit apply. And you see how it did that? It made that change right there to quad elements. Um, quad elements are generally much more beneficial because they don't require as many quad elements for accuracy. Um, you know, tets re generally require a lot more elements to kind of reach that mesh convergence, meaning your stress or uh, result values aren't going to be inaccurate. Some of the other really cool things you can do on the meshing side of things, and again, I'm not going to be able to show everything, but definite features that I typically like to do is, you know, maybe make some node adjustments. So in this case, I could potentially um, click on uh, this element here. And let me kind of split this quad. And you see how I, that splits it in two. It changes that quad to tries. And vice versa, I can change it back. Um, from two tries to a quad. So that's some pretty powerful capabilities. We can also create elements. You know, say you, you're importing a model, sometimes this happens with point cloud data where you're looking at like a, a reverse scan and there's missing elements, you could actually create an element. But in our case, we brought in a CAD model. So it does a pretty good job of bringing in those components. Um, so at this point, we're now ready to mesh and I'm gonna actually create a hex mesher because I think that's one of the really cool things about our tool um, on the 3D side. Obviously we can create a tet mesh, um, probably fairly, fairly familiar if you've ever used um, a, a sort of CAD tool with tet meshing. We do have higher order tets, which this is something that most CAD based FEA tools don't have. But one of the things that, you know, um, a lot of our customers may run into when they're looking at, you know, uh, maybe utilizing our tools is taking advantage of hex, hex meshing. Hex meshing um, really kind of enables the users to solve some problems um, without having to have as much of a dense of a mesh than you would, would with a tet mesh. So if I click on auto hex, this is just using the, the proprietary hex mesher. Obviously there's some manual hex meshing commands here I could run through, but I'm just gonna use the auto-based uh, mesher. And this is what it's doing. It's gonna create the, the final 3D mesh. It's gonna use the mapped data. And remember, we have some tries, we have some quads, but it's gonna utilize the data we specified from the surface mesh and then um, sort of create that, that auto hex mesh. So let's do that. And it's gonna go through this process automatically for us. So see like, like that, it creates that hex mesh. Uh, a very nice mesh to utilize, um, does it very much. And that's something that's very, very powerful within the context of our tools um, from, a, from a hex meshing perspective. I'm gonna open up another model here, just a more advanced kind of meshing example, just so you guys can see, so again, some of the power of our meshing. Um, so this is a much more complicated mesh, um, but I just wanna show some further sort of uh, meshing commands and advanced meshing capabilities we have within our tool. Because again, you may not necessarily be utilizing our solvers, but hopefully you, you, know, you can, because that's one of the powers of SimLab, but we have customers that um, may just want to use us for pre-processing and meshing, and our meshing capabilities are very powerful. 
So when we look here, here's an application where um, you know you, you get a model and maybe you decide you don't want to model these chamfers. Um, traditionally, you'd have to go back to your CAD platform and kind of make those changes, but there's a quick way of being able to get rid of those chamfers directly within our tool. So let's actually go through that. I'm just going to show you how you, how you can do that very easily within our tool. So when we go to geometry, um, there is under our feature icon, there's ways of removing elements and you know uh, uh, adding elements. There's this tool called Flatten. And you see the icon kind of shows it's kind of uh, for chamfers specifically. So if I click on Flatten and I click on that icon, um, what you'll see is I'm specifying a thickness of that face. And that thickness represents the distance down to those chamfers. Notice if I increase it up to two, it grabs that, that big chamfer right there. But for the sake of just visually showing, it's gonna retain the uh, kind of middle, middle chamfer and get rid of the smaller chamfers, I'm gonna do that. All right, so see how it retains the kind of the larger cham chamfer, but if I come in, the whole face is now flattened. So without having to make any sort of geometry changes, I did that all directly on the mesh, which is something that's super powerful. Um, some of the other really powerful things within the tools, um, specifically when you look at uh, meshing in a lot of, con you know, sometimes when you're trying to make changes to a mesh, it can be sometimes you might have these partitions in a face. So you see right here, if I click on these faces, these are three faces, but they're all aligned. What we can actually do is we can actually, you know, kind of remove those partitions and merge the faces directly. So right here under my edit, I can click merge face. And now it's one face and we can get rid of these funky elements right here. This is something you, you wouldn't want, something of a high aspect ratio. So I can show that, that command I previously just showed you with the, the remesh. And let me just make sure, yep. remesh and I'm gonna grab this face. And I don't know what, the, what a good size is. Let's try two millimeters. There we go. And there's still some distorted elements, but in general, it kind of cleans up the face. So it's something that's, again, very powerful and some of the advanced tools you can utilize on, on the meshing side of things. Um, another really kind of useful tool is, um, again, just we're all talking about some of the cool things you can do in meshing is kind of getting rid of features that may not be, again, necessary anymore. So in this case, there's kind of a curvature cutout right here. Maybe we you know, we decided on a design-based iteration that we wanted to remove this and flatten everything out. So traditionally in other tools, you'd have to go back and change the CAD. Uh, within SimLab, you can do everything and sort of adjust that mesh accordingly. So under geometry and features, there's this right where the flatten tool was, there's this feature called align. So what we can actually do is we can align both these faces. So we wanna be them directly planar and hit define modify plane and I'm gonna specify a planar face and I'll just specify this planar face hit okay and then hit apply and you see when it did that it kind of directly up made everything and let me hide this now everything is planar so again it, it's all being done very instantaneously without having to make changes in the CAD perspective now you are probably seeing that there's some kind of element discontinuity here so great way we can just go back and remesh it. So I'm gonna remesh all these surfaces. Let's just try two again, that should be good enough. Yeah, and that definitely cleans things up. I might go back a little bit further and make the mesh a little bit finer, but this illustrates to you all some of the power and capabilities you have within meshing. All right, I'm gonna hop back into my slide deck now. We can talk about um, solutions. So we talked about meshing and obviously that was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we could do a whole bunch of 2D meshing, um, 3D meshing, even 1D meshing, which would be bolts, et cetera. Uh, but you kind of saw that kind of the powerful capabilities you have in meshing. Now, one of the other real powerful capabilities is solutions. Um, really when you're trying to solve these problems, you know, maybe you're actually trying to solve a variety of problems. 
And the beauty of a multi-physics environment is you get used to the interface and it makes it very easy to run a variety of problems. So um, within, within Altair SimLab, we can solve with using our structural solvers like uh, Radios and OptiStruct. And those run the gamut from linear statics all the way through uh, explicit dynamics, um, which would be Radios. Um, so you can run those traditional structural studies. Uh, we have a number of flow studies uh, capabilities within SimLab. So there is the uh, traditional sort of CFD uh, simulation with an AccuSolve, which can run both fluid flow problems and also heat transfer. So if you're trying to consider convection and natural convection, you can run those within flow. Um, and you kind of see there, here's a CFD and all these are post-processed directly within SimLab. So CFD, here's a structural sort of static case and here's actually optimization. And then we have a bunch of other um, solvers as well. So electronics thermal management, that's another CFD solver. It's using our electroflow solver. Um, that's really beneficial if you're working with PCBs and a lot of components for thermal management, that becomes a very beneficial solver. Um, go up ranging to manufacturing solvers like injection molding or welding analysis tools, we can utilize those. And then um, optimization, and coupling solutions. So I'll show an example of a coupled solution. That would be, you know, the, the application I'm going to show you is running a CFD case and then extracting the fluid pressure and temperature gradient to run um, for stress analysis. So the beauty of this is you can create a mesh for, you know, a variety, you know, one study and then utilize that mesh for an additional study. That's definitely the, the power and advantage of a multi physics environment. The other advantage of working in a multi-physics environment is you may not be a dedicated stress analyst. So you may not always be jumping into CAE all the time. It might be you need to run it after you've done a design, you know, uh, gone through kind of the design life cycle and apart, and you're jumping back into simulation. Um, that's the other kind of beauty of our tool. We still leverage the power of our advanced solvers, um, but we make the interface very easy to, to utilize. So let's jump into a demonstration. Um, I have a couple demonstrations, so we'll run through a bunch of different ways of solving within SimLab. So we'll kind of first dip our feet into kind of an easy example, and then we'll jump into some more advanced examples as we work our way through this. So uh, we'll first come back to this logo example um, right here. And um, in our case, let's just sort of work our way through setting up a linear static study. And um, I'll generate a mesh here, probably a pretty familiar mesh to what we just previously utilized. Um, so let me go to inches here. This is the exact workflow that we'd, we select our part, specify our mesh size, generate that mesh for the surface mesh, and then I'll create a hex mesh since I was showing that previously. So I'll use that hex tool, auto hex. Click on the component, use a 0.125 element size and hit OK. Some of the other studies I'm gonna show, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna have the meshing pre-done, but this study will kind of start from scratch so you guys can see it in real time. So we've generated the mesh. Um, in the model browser, you'll see this. Kind of the other cool thing about SimLab is like I said, um, we have our original CAD geometry, um, but then we create a FEM representation. So where kind of CAD FEA tools or CAD CFT tools tend to fail is when they, because they, they create the mesh directly on the CAD geometry. And we start having complex geometry, it starts to become very, very hard to mesh within those tools. Um, in our case, we create this FEM representation and that gives us the ability to kind of delete elements and, and make changes accordingly. All right, so now let's create a study. I'm gonna delete these solutions. So we start from kind of square one. How do we actually, you know, once we create a mesh, how do we actually um, set up a, a linear static case? So pretty easy. We go to our solutions tab and we specify structural. So right here, you see within SimLab, we have all these different solvers available just within the actual structural case. Um, I'm going to just point, only point out real quickly some of the others. So we'll come back to the structural. So thermal, you kind of see uh, steady state uh, as well as transient um, flow, which we will show. Um, electromagnetics, which we're not going to show an electromagnetics example, but you could run um, utilizing the flux solver 
um, for you know electrostatics or magnet statics and some of these others. Um, so that you, you have a lot of capabilities. You're kind of leveraging all the solvers within Altair. All right, so let's go to a structural solver and I'm gonna click on this body and hit okay. So the, the nice thing about the GUI is it automatically updates. You see, once I create the study, it automatically takes you to the analysis tab where I can define components. Um, so the first thing you kind of work your way from left to right is we can define a material. And in our case, we can specify, you know, um, what we want that material to be called. And then also if you wanted to kind of adjust these values, typical structural values, you also have capabilities of changing these to be temperature dependent. Um, also changing if you want to use orthotropic or engineering constants, you can go that route as well. So I'll just use that material we just created. Um, in this case, we can go to our loads and constraints. I'm going to specify, I'm going to, I'm going to restrain one edge, I'm going to restrain um, that edge. And a fixed constraint just means all these elements and nodes are going to be locked in place for translation and rotational degrees of freedom. And then I'm also going to apply uh, a force. In this case, I'm just going to apply distributed pressure. Note you have a lot of capabilities. Um, and these also change. You'll see as we jump into the explicit dynamic, the some of the types of loads you can apply are going to be different. But these are all the loads you would have within a linear static context. Uh, pretty much all the loads you would need um, in this case. And I'll just apply a pressure on this face, kind of keep things pretty simple. All right, so at that point, we've now applied our properties, our material, um, and all we have to do is right click and hit update. So at, when we hit update, we are actually solving. Now there are ways we can change um, some of our advanced criteria under result request, we could kind of change these to be different output file formats or change our solvers, but I just kept things pretty simple. So as far as the post-processing, it's very, very powerful, um, but also very easy to utilize. Um, I can, one of the first things I always do, this is just reverting back to kind of when I learned FEA years ago, is I always animate my results. Um, animating my results just kind of tells me does it make sense based on how I've constrained my system? I can adjust this animation. You know, that makes sense. It's locked in place. It's showing me how I'd expect of a distributed pressure on that face. And note, everything that I'm showing right now can be saved out. It can be saved out to an animation format or specifically saved out as a sort of a nice uh, uh, static 2D picture as well. Um, all the values you'd, you'd, you'd kind of be interested in in terms of stress and um, displacement and strain. Um, we can also adjust the legend right here. So maybe I want to go down to right here. Obviously, it's a really small pressure, so there's not much happening. But if we change that, you kind of see what, what directly happens when you adjust the scale of the tool. One of the other really powerful things from a post-processing perspective is I can query everywhere in the model. So I could directly click on an element and see directly what that value is. So we have von Mises stress showing. So right here at that node, it's telling me what that, that value is. I can change it to element or points, and I could do this for any of the results I'm generating. The other really nice thing about this is I can change my color scale. Um, I can sort of adjust these accordingly to be something that's more pertinent to your own sort of look. So if I change this to red and blue, you can kind of make these changes. Kind of the last thing I'll show in the post-processing end before we jump into another uh, solution is just the ISO surface capability. Um, it really makes things very easy to understand. So, you know, right here, as I adjust this ISO surface, you see everywhere that's at that stress value or less is showing. Um, I can change this also to displacement, hit apply, and showing you that at this displacement value. And as I adjust it, it's kind of telling you where your max and min displacements are located at. Okay, great. So let's jump into a more advanced model. Um, we'll jump into another application here. So let me just load that up. So let's jump into drop test. And I believe I wanna open up this file here.
Okay, so drop test would be under this module right here. Um, again, same exact workflow. And the other kind of cool thing about this model, so let me just hide results so you see it, is I can actually utilize mixed meshing. So um, mixed meshing could be, you know, in this case, we're talking about it from a 3D perspective um, and, and hex and tet elements, which is the case. Um, I can also change my transparency so you can kind of see what this looks like on the interior by right-clicking inverting transparency. So I see a cell phone. Those of you who are in consumer goods design, drop testing is probably very pertinent to you. Um, the advantage of sort of implementing a drop test um, within a C perspective is, as you're probably aware, um, jumping to the field, um, setting up time to actually do the drop test, um, rigging equipment can be very tedious. You can actually do the drop testing as you're actually designing the part directly within CAE with a very easy to utilize interface. And our drop test um, solver is Radios. Radios is an explicit solver. Um, if you're familiar with Radios, it's capable of impact studies and ballistic impact and car crash. So it can do a lot of things. And what you typically want for a drop test solver is an explicit solver in terms of maximizing efficiency while sort of delivering that accuracy. Um, so let me reset the transparency. So like I said, there's a combination of hex elements, and TET elements in the system. I've already done the meshing, so I'm not gonna go over that just for the sake of time, but um, that's just something else. You have mixed meshing capabilities built within our tool. Um, so both on the 2D, 3D, and also different types of elements you can utilize. So to start a drop test solution, same exact workflow, generate a mesh first, and then we start our solution. And then you'd select the bodies you wish to include. So I'd click on all these bodies and then I'd hit okay to start the drop test. So let's review um, the boundary conditions of this system. So when I actually go over to the model, um, one of the, the key things to kind of point out about our tool is obviously it's capable of running drop tests, but we can also look at impact. You know, some typically if you're doing consumer goods, you probably are doing a drop test, but you also might be doing an impact or hammer test where you, you have some type of heavy device running into the device. So we're capable of both. We're not, you know, some lower tier tools, they just have drop testing. This actually has capabilities for kind of advanced dynamics built within the tool. So our first boundary condition in this case is um, uh, we're specifying uh, 4,500 mil millimeters per second um, in the negative Y direction. So you see our global triad right here, that's being applied. And then we're specifying it's it's our our wall our impact surface. Um, we're saying we're specifying this as rigid, but if we wanted to adjust the actual rigidity, we could do that uh, by sort of making adjustments to the Young's modulus and density accordingly. So again, you're not fully you know you can sort of adjust your actual impact, and that's kind of the beauty of our solver is you can actually adjust these things with a very easy to utilize interface. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, I utilize the automatic uh, contacts to kind of generate the contacts in the system for all these connected parts of an assemblies. That again, kind of reduces the time to actually get up and running uh, with contacts. So it's a very easy to set up tool. So let's kind of look at um, the results now. And I'm gonna slow down my animation a little bit. And we can see it kind of dropping and that impact. So typically in drop studies, you're kind of worried about, um, you know, the time after impact and something that happens very rapidly. Um, one of the things that's also really cool about our tool is, you know, we're seeing kind of the LCD screen, there's a lot of stress occurring right there, but maybe we wanna look, look at the interior. Um, very easy to do that. We can go to our browser and just deselect it and then post process accordingly. Um, the same exact, uh, post-processing tools you saw in linear statics would be available here. So again, it kind of keeps the learning curve very user-friendly. You know, once you kind of get the gist of how to run something in linear statics, obviously there's a, some different boundary conditions, different uh, setup parameters, but post-processing is very similar. So I could right-click, I could quit query results, and I could click on a component and see what that stress value is. Uh, a couple other things to point out before I move into kind of a, another model is you also have some pertinent values which you'd wanna see uh, within the drop testing context like acceleration, kind of see our acceleration, some high acceleration 
uh, perspectives. So other things that may be pertinent when you're doing a drop test to make sure you kind of meet those design criteria um, that you'd be interested in. Great. So let me open up my final solution here. And again, these are all just some interesting examples I brought up. I can't get into every single solution, but hopefully this is giving you an idea of the power within the tool uh, of SimLab. So I'm now gonna show a CFD example and specifically an example um, where uh, we actually are um, running CFD and then also running a, a thermal structural test uh, uh, analysis, which means I'm coupling the CFD with a structural analysis. All right. All right, so let me kind of run through how to set this up. So very similar um, on the meshing side of things, you generate the mesh. Um, obviously, probably the only thing that's kind of different within the CFD context is you might apply a CFD-based volume mesh, which means you can kind of control how many boundary layers there are. So if you're, you're familiar with CFD, um, you can kind of control the number of boundary layers of meshing. But otherwise, um, we can kind of utilize the same type of TEP mesh that you would in a structural study. So in this case, we have an intake manifold. Uh, with air flowing through and then steel on the pipe. So right here, the pipe itself is modeled as stainless steel. Um, and then um, if I hide the pipe, you kind of see the internal fluid, which is the air that's being modeled. Um, once we kind of uh, generate the mesh, like we do with the previous problems I've shown, we click on the flow tab, which is using AccuSolve. Um, AccuSolve is one of our legacy CFD solvers. Um, we would specify the, the bodies we would want to include and the type of physics we want, so compressible. One of the things that's really cool about this is we can take advantage of some advanced capabilities. Again, a lot of um, other sort of uh, CAD-based, CFD-based tools don't have advanced turbulence models. They're kind of just based off K-Epsilon. Uh, we have a lot of built-in turbulence models you can utilize um, directly within this environment. Um, we can also run um, heat transfer. So in this case, it's a fluid flow problem and heat transfer. And like I already mentioned, it's capable of all modes of heat transfer um, within uh, our CFD tool. So great, we've generated the mesh. Let me step you through the actual boundary conditions themselves. So when I go to our actual analysis, the boundary conditions you see right here, um, uh, there's kind of, kind of standard inlet condition. So let's look at our inlet condition is these four faces right here um, that air is coming into at eight meters per second, um, pretty hot at about 700 Kelvin coming in. Um, we can also adjust the turbulence if you want, but we're just gonna use a kind of an automatic um, turbulence coming into the system. Um, our outlet is just going to atmospheric. So it's just at this exit right here. So if I click on here on this face, this is just the outlet condition. Um, again, we have some advanced capabilities here. If you want to sort of adjust um, your conditions, you can go that route accordingly. Um, and then our final boundary condition is just a convection coefficient. Um, I, di I did that from simply a, a simple modeling perspective by putting a convection coefficient. Now you may be asking yourself, well, Kemp, couldn't I have just applied gravity? I could have done that as well. And um, by applying a convection coefficient, it actually just solves a little bit quicker than turning on gravity. So that's kind of the approach I went, but you can run gravity for natural convection. That's really what that convection coefficient is showing. A couple other things I'll point out just because it's not just if you're curious on the CFD side of things, um, is we have a bunch of advanced boundary conditions for periodicity. Um, if you have a really long model, and you want to sort of simplify the meshing approach, we can take advantage of that with periodics. Same thing with far field and baffles. Um, ability to apply radiation, as well as applying slip conditions. Some of the other things that generally pop up when I'm talking to customers is maybe you're you know, dealing with pipe design um, and you have some type of membrane or filter, we can apply porosity and specify our permeability on the system. Um, or maybe you're doing PCB, des uh, PCB design and uh, you wanna sort of adjust a fan, maybe key in a fan curve, we can do that as well or even applying a heat exchanger, like um, maybe simplifying the system down, you can apply a heat exchanger. So we have a lot of advanced capabilities built within CFD. So in our case, we set up our system. Um, 
we can now look at our results, hit display. And very, very cool. We can, you know, obviously use the same post processing. I can create uh, cross sectional views right here. And remember, this is a, a thermal application. I'm looking at temperature, kind of what my hot spots are in the system. Um, I can also kind of use that same kind of ISO surface tool I was showing you on the structural end, and now I'll use it with the CFD context. So if I move this to the left, the whole model is going to show, and everywhere that's at 685 or above is showing. So just telling you where hot air is going to be and where it's not going to be. Probably another thing that might be pertinent from the CFD perspective would be velocity. So how, I'm how my airspeed is being influenced by that hot sort of uh, hot temperature. Um, everything that's showing on the screen is at, let's just type in 18 meters uh, per second. Um, and then everything, I can also reverse this to be, say everything below 18 meters per second. So definitely some advanced capabilities in terms of post-processing. All right, so this looks pretty good. Um, now, one of the, the cool things about SimLab is we can easily couple the solution, meaning that, you know, if I was doing this design for this intake manifold, I'd want to extract this temperature, and I'd also want to extract the actual fluid pressure because there is uh, air coming in, moving as it's heating up that those particles get sort of energized. I want to see what those fluid pressure and also um, that temperature gradient is going to be because we know that as something heats up, it's going to cause it to contract and expand, um, and that's going to sort of induce stress. So what we can do is we can actually create another solution. So we would right click, hit create solution and specify linear static. In our case, we'd specify the pipe, since that's what we want to look at, and we'd hit OK. So I'm going to hide these results, and we can step through the coupled case now. All right, so the first thing is obviously if we're running a structural case, and let me just make sure this is set, there we go. If we're running a structural case, we need to restrain it. You know, in our case, I just ran a linear static application. So what I did is I actually restrained um, a couple faces here. And I'm just gonna hide the fluid because we're not looking at the fluid in this case, um, is I wanted to restrain the top face right here. And I'm just applying a face constraint there. And then also I wanted to restrain um, kind of these bolt hole locations down here at the bottom. So if I right click and just double click and you kind of see those locations I'm restraining. So once my model is constrained, then I wanna actually um, input the actual loads and parameters from my CFD study. So I can easily do that. I can right click and I can hit include temperature from my flow study right here. When it does that, it's gonna bring in that flow study. And then I can also right click and say, I wanna include the pressure gradient. I can do that as well from my flow study. So you see how it says flow, that's what it's referencing above. Um, so we have that capability. So if I turn on the map temperature, this is showing you at every single node, it's mapping that thermal gradient. And then also I could show the map pressure that's being applied as well. So once I do that, I'm gonna hide a couple of these just to make it a little bit easier to view our results. I can right click on my results and hit display. And then I show what's happening to the stress value. I can also show what's happening to the displacement. Um, so definitely very, very cool, you know, makes it very easy to couple these studies. Um, and I think, you know, uh, that makes things very, very easy going from a CFD to FEA perspective. Great. So again, I didn't get to touch every single um, scenario but you have the capability to run a lot of different studies um, within the context. Another thing that, you know, looking at optimization, that's a very powerful uh, tool uh, we can also run within SimLab. Uh, I just showed up, I wanted to show an explicit case and also show this coupled CFD case. So I wanna hop back into my slide deck. There's one more thing I wanna talk about within SimLab is automation. So, um, this is something that I don't think it's talked about enough, but there's so many capabilities here within scripting. I know probably a lot of you have probably done some type of scripting or written macros before, you know, MATLAB, Excel, et cetera. Um, 
everything that's built into SimLab can be scripted in Python, which is great. It's a very easy language if you've never looked into learning Python, but we can also script in JavaScript or XML. Um, some of the nice things about our scripting um, capabilities is it does allow for real-time macro recording, um, which makes scripting commands a little bit more efficient. You know, um, if you're kind of, you click on a GUI and you're recording it, you can actually look at, you know, what the actual Python code you would need to kind of generate that. Um, and you can utilize the scripting for a lot of applications. So I kind of mentioned previously optimization or DOE, design of experiments. So say you're, you've set up your initial scenario um, and probably a lot of you guys are probably gonna have a kind of continuous product lines that you may evolve over time. By setting up your initial sort of study in SimLab and maybe you, you know, for the next product, the next year out, you're designing your next product, you can sort of automate that process by just utilizing the existing SimLab model and then scripting a couple things there you would change. So it can save you a lot of time if you're doing tasks, you know, uh, over and over, something where you benefit from automation. Um, so let's take a look at an automation application. I'm not going to spend a ton of time, but it's definitely, I think, very powerful what you can do. Um, one of the things I do want to point out is just the script and what it's what it's doing. So here's an example of Python scripting. Um, in this case, what, what the ultimate goal was is I want to import some models. I'm going to import some parasolids um, from the directories. It's actually going to import two parasolids. I want, I want it to generate two SimLab projects. And then what I wanted to do is I wanted to automatically create the mesh. And this mesh criteria right here, you see that the values that I definitely want are based off of things that for my industry, what I would need. So for instance, what my skew value needs to be, what my stretch value needs to be, what my Jacobian ratio needs to be. These are things I'm keying in to say that this is what the value needs to be. Aspect ratio is set at 10 and then um, run this actual code. So what we can do is let's just open up a start, start from a new database right here. I go up to the scripting tab, hit play, because I already generated that Python script, hit auto. And let me go back a folder, go to automation, and you see this Python script right here. So once I hit open, it's gonna, gen it's gonna run the actual script since I hit play. And it's gonna go through this process of opening these files, which is the first step in the Python script I created. And then it's gonna generate the mesh based off the mesh parameters. So you see how it did that for the first one, opened up the second file, and now it's going through the mesh parameters. Note, I didn't actually do anything. I didn't actually have to click on the mesh. The Python script did everything with the system. Now I have a study where I've already generated my mesh um, and I can kind of jump into actually solving. So you can kind of see the power um, that you can utilize with scripting that other tools don't have those capabilities. Uh, the other thing I mentioned um, when we're looking at scripting is every single thing, you know, prompt you're doing in SimLab, you can actually open a session script. And this is gonna show you that the real life session script for Python. So like I said, if you're not familiar with Python, this will actually, you know, it's a good way to kind of learn your way through it um, where you can kind of still click on the GUI and the icons and then have it, it's gonna be generating this Python script in the background. Definitely there's a lot of power here in terms of capability and what you can do. Great. So I'm gonna come back to my slide deck. Um, so it kind of brings us to the end. Um, definitely wanted to hope you guys got a good understanding of where you can go with, with SimLab. There's so many different things. I think the beauty of it is it's a very easy to utilize tool um, that really, you know, for somebody who's not in CA every single day, you can jump back into the tool, but you can also run some very advanced scenarios. Now we have some great sort of designer-based simulation tools like Inspire um, and some of these others, which are very easy FEA tools, but they don't have a lot of power. SimLab is an easy to utilize tool, but it also has a lot of power. We can run some very advanced simulations within our multi-physics environment. Um, so a couple other things I'll point out. Um, I encourage you guys to check out our blog um, and our YouTube channel. And I'll just bring those up real quick so you can see it. Our blog is continuously being updated with new blog articles, as well as our YouTube channel. We're continuously pushing out content there for how to's and just different capabilities. So let me just show that. Um, so if you go to our website, 
which is just trueinsight.io. Um, go over here and go to True Insight blog, and you can take a look at our blog. Um, there's also a bunch of other great resources on our website if you want to check out, you know, just about different products, etc. And also, you can go to our YouTube page, and we can go right here and see a bunch of the videos we're putting out. So. I want to thank you all for taking the time. And if you feel free, definitely subscribe. It's definitely keep, keeps you alert of the new videos. Like I said, we're, we're pushing out new videos. So I want to thank you all for taking the time to attend. I'm going to send the, the last few minutes for any questions that maybe Tyler didn't address.